Folks, welcome. Um, I'm Anna Gelper and I teach law at Georgetown. Uh, and I am beyond thrilled to introduce our uh, final uh, featured speaker, um, Professor Larry Summers, who's the, who A, needs no introduction, but hey, um, is uh, Charles Elliott Professor and President Emer Emeritus at Harvard, former Treasury Secretary and from my perspective, probably the most stimulating free associator and funnest person to brainstorm with of all I know. Um, we are thrilled to lure him to uh, this conference and very grateful to uh, have an opportunity to ask some questions um, and uh, perhaps free associate together some. So, um, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A, not in the chat. We will try to leave some uh, Q&A, some time for the Q&A towards the end of the conversation. Um, and to those watching us on TV um, now or later, sorry, you can't ask the questions. Um, okay, um, Larry, well, again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and if you don't mind, uh, let's jump right in because right. you have only so much time. Um, so first I want to ask you, uh, a couple of current events, uh, questions, but really the focus for us is to figure out to what extent we can, um, make the relationship between the study of macroeconomics and macroeconomic policy and uh, law, uh, lawmaking, practice of law and legal scholarship um, in, conversa in productive conversation with each other. Um, with that, um, I was excited to see that you had nice things to say about the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, my excitement was not so much for the merits of the legislation, but your angle on it um, and what it tells us about the law. So you said that uh, you know it's a good bit of legislation it, it promises to raise revenues, help boost supply in key areas, reduce prices, and thereby on net have a uh, uh, help reduce inflation over time. So to what extent is something like this a model for lawmaking um, and more broadly other legislative and regulatory interventions in the economy. And it's good to be with you. Um, when you and I first uh, met, um, I was a Senate confirmed official in the Treasury Department and a fairly young one. And you were a young lawyer in the Treasury Department and you brought um, wisdom, not just saying what was legal and what was illegal, but figuring out how we could do things that we wanted to do in the most efficient and the most protective uh, way. And I learned a lot about the positive functioning of lawyering um, from my experiences uh, working with you. Look, I think the Inflation Reduction Act is good law. I think it's good law because I think the benefits of substantially uh, subsidizing a variety of renewable technologies exceed the costs. I think there are measures included in the bill that will cause taxpayers to get a better deal when they buy pharmaceuticals and cause healthcare to be more widely available for disadvantaged Americans. And I think there's some vitally important investments in uh, turning the IRS around. And I think those are all good things. I think the cumulative impact of the bill is likely to be to reduce a little bit the inflation rate by reducing energy prices through more supply, by reducing pharmaceutical prices through better bargaining power, and through some reductions 
over time in the government budget deficit, which uh, reduce demand at a time when the economy is overheated. I don't think if you were describing the primary impacts or primary thrusts of the bill, you probably would have titled it the Inflation Reduction Act. And that was a reflection of the moment and uh, the various political imperatives involved. But I think it was a good thing uh, for our country uh, to uh, do. I think no one should be under an illusion that that bill can be the center of a national effort to control inflation. I think that such an effort has to be centered on monetary policy. And insofar as there are other policies, they are probably regulatory and uh, tariff uh, policies of a kind primarily not addressed in uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. Well, this is super helpful and 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 generous. Now, um, on you mentioned, and thank you, regulatory. Um, should regulation then be more countercyclical than it is, right? So I I think um, I think something I mostly disagreed with in the law and macroeconomics movement is a desire to center the analysis of a variety of microeconomic policies around macroeconomic considerations. And there's always a question when you envision any change, what you hold, uh, what you hold constant. If I, if I want to analyze the effect of moving my left foot forward on my locomotion, I have to make an assumption about what my right foot is going to do. And we sort of make a natural assumption that what's going to happen is my right foot's going to move along with uh, a walking motion. And there's a question when we consider a regulatory action um, say you mandated that firms hire more people. And one line of analysis would be that that would have a multiplier effect because the firms would pay people, uh, would pay the extra workers they hired, and uh, those workers would spend money and those workers would spend money and you'd have a multiplier effect and you'd stimulate the economy. A different view would be that the Fed has a view about how much aggregate demand it wants to achieve, and it targets the aggregate demand level that it wants to achieve. And so if other things happen, those will be offset by the Fed because it's still targeting the same aggregate uh, demand level. So if you have a room with a thermostat and you open the window a little bit, you will not change the temperature of the room. You will change how much the heating system uh, operates. And I think, and I'm not deeply familiar with it, but insofar as I've been exposed to the law and macroeconomics movement, it has a tendency to forget that lesson. And it has a tendency, as, it, as I see it, to, and by the way, I'm not authoritative about what's true, but I am authoritative about what I perceive. Um, the, um, uh, has a tendency to forget that lesson. Now, you know, you can argue that sometimes we're at the zero lower bound and sometimes policy operates with lags. And so it's, more complicated than I just said, but I think as a general matter, if we ignored aggregate demand effects, when we thought about regulatory questions, we would get it more right than if we try 
to always analyze the aggregate demand consequences. So for example, when people in the financial industry say that we're cutting back on lending by imposing excessive capital regulations on financial institutions, I mostly disregard that because if that's causing a shortage of demand, I imagine we'll have lower interest rates as a consequence uh, of that. So while there are some particular exceptions that one can do, I think that far more mischief is accomplished by allowing Keynesian aggregate demand effects to enter the conversation about micro policies than any benefits that ever result. So let's pull back a little bit, and this is extremely helpful in also kind of defining the terms. On the bright side, um, law and macroeconomics movement, trend, ethos, whatever we want to call it, um, is at least at this stage is sort of open enough to definition that I think we can play around quite freely um, with that. But, and really the big question to my mind, and I certainly don't have a monopoly on this, is sort of how do we engage with macroeconomic concepts? And um, several of the things you mentioned uh, actually raise interesting kind of legal institutional questions. So let's say, you know, regulation should not um, primarily uh, target aggregate demand, maybe not even, you know, take account of it. Let's just rely on the Fed. But then the Fed does not operate in an institutional vacuum, nor does the ECB, nor does, you know, so the, of what I'm, the way the transmission mechanisms, right, operate quite differently. Well, I, okay, wait, like Europe and the US did very different things about unemployment in the middle of COVID, right? Sort of the how, how we deal with recessions, crises, downturns institutionally either makes things easier or more complicated for, let's say, the Fed, and and not even just easier. I don't think I really, I, don't, I, I think I pretty much disagree with everything okay. you just said. All right. Um, I, I think that the right assumption for microeconomic analysis is that the level of demand is determined and it's determined by monetary policy mm -hmm. out of some set of considerations having to do with unemployment, having to do with inflation, having to do with financial stability, whatever. And that any effects on those things that come from your microeconomic policies are going to be sterilized. And so I don't think in rooms with thermostats, it's very interesting to think about the impact of uh, opening the window on the temperature or op or having a fire or uh, putting on a sweater or anything. Well, right. Or, I mean, it's all the or thermostats. Anything like that. So that doesn't mean it's not an important question whether you should open the window. Right. You should decide the question about opening the window on the basis of whether you think the air is going to be fresher on the basis of what you think is going to happen to the electricity bills if you do it, on uh, the basis of whether bad stuff's going to blow in uh, when you open the window, but, but, not, but, based, not based on anything much about the temperature of the room. So I don't know whether the approach of paying people unemployment insurance or the approach of paying people to paying firms to retain uh, their uh, workers or the approach, which of those approaches is the was the right one to respond to the downturn. Mm -hmm. But my judgment about that would be based on which would be microeconomically efficient in finding the right balance between, on the one hand, promoting labor mobility, which is good, and on the other hand, preventing the severance of important attachments, um, which is bad. And those would be the considerations 
that I would think was important, not one of them will lead to more demand in the economy or less demand in the economy and therefore do more recession prevention than the so, other. So Larry, like, got it. But it also, I think it depends on whether you're, you know, sort of operating the windows or are, you know, are in charge of the thermostat, right? And what you're doing in the room relies on the thermostat working properly. So right. And I think the I think all who designs the thermostat? What's I'm sorry? So who designs the thermostat? Who pushes the buttons? You know, like the ECB I think bank almost, of English, I, I, I think they're almost, all different. Ev almost every time somebody tries to do a microeconomic policy that is premised on some theory of some flaw in the way the macroeconomic things work, we're much more likely to see a confused mistake than an affirmative benefit. So macroprudential regulation, eh? No, macroprudential regulation, if the reason we're doing macroprudential, well, if, I'm sorry, by macroprudential regulation, do you mean variable capital requirements and the like? Variable capital requirements. Right. So I think, I think that, should be, that should be based on judgments about preventing banks from failing and that it's inefficient and costly when banks fail, not mm -hmm. based on prevent, uh, not based on maximizing employment by mm -hmm. maintaining continuous aggregate, by maintaining continuous aggregate demand. In uh, fact, I'm pretty right. skeptical of mm -hmm. macro prudential regulation because my general view is that by and large, the smartest macro traders in the world can't time markets. And so I'm highly, highly skeptical that politically motivated $150,000 a year bureaucrats will be able to time uh, markets. And so when people are deciding whether there's a speculative bubble or not, and then adjusting the capital requirement or whatever, I think they're much more, I think they're as likely to be wrong as uh, to be right. And I'm pretty familiar with the academic literature on this, which is a bunch of regressions showing that when credit expansion is high, then you're more likely to have a bubble and stuff like that. And my reaction is if those regressions were so terrific and were so substantially predictive, there would be people who would be able to make huge sums of money shorting bubbles and going long troughs based on those regressions. And mostly there aren't. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because there are a variety of sort of epistemological problems of what constitutes certainty. But um, I have right. no objection in principle to macroprudential uh, regulation. I would note that the poster child for macroprudential regulation in 2006 and 2007 was Spain, which had roughly yep. the worst egregious overbuilding of uh, capital. I would note that Alan Greenspan was a pretty shrewd guy and he declared irrational exuberance in the stock market when the Dow was at 6,300 and proceeded to double over the next uh, two, over the next two years, or next four, next, uh, four years. Um, so I'm sort of skeptical of the enterprise but insofar as it's a useful enterprise, mm -hmm. it's an enterprise that's about the microeconomic efficiency of the financial intermediation sector, not the efficacy of countercyclical aggregate demand management. Okay. Um, so 
And also something that you said earlier about uh, the bankers complaining about high capital requirements, et cetera, et cetera. So that that it's sort of it, this position strikes me as going with that. Yeah, correct. It's, right. It's um, a position. It's a position that, um, by and large, um, I think it is better to have more focused policies with more specific outcome accountability for outcomes close to mm -hmm. those policies so, so this in, in general for example i tend to think that we have a whole set of tax and transfer instruments in the society if it were up to me i would make them more generous um but we have all of those instruments and so if somebody says, how should we regulate trains? And somebody says, well, we should do X with trains because that will benefit poor people. I tend to think, no, if we want to benefit poor people more, we should do different taxes and transfers. And the taxes and transfers we do reflect some political equilibrium. And if we do something with railroad policy, that has a major change, has a major impact, it will intend, it will tend to be in political equilibrium offset by other things. So I tend to prefer my prefer the conduct of microeconomic policy to be focused on efficiency within its sphere. So let's talk about can we just spend a nanosecond on thermostat design, right? It's all macroeconomic policy. It's all in one place, but we have a wide variety of central bank designs, um, both, uh, you know, objectives, mandates, instruments. Uh, you know, most recently there was a paper in the conference on, um, uh, you know, the TPI, the Transmission Protection instrument um i may be mangling the you know of the ecb um there are certain things that to lay eyes and maybe to lawyer lay eyes um don't necessarily look like adjusting the thermostat um but look more like messing around with the room right and my sense is that they're the design of central banks and the instruments that the central banks deploy um, differ quite a lot. And so does that, is that uh, just sort of noise to your mind? Does that matter? Does it matter that the Fed's authorities were expanded in some ways, you know, constrained in other ways in Dodd-Frank, right? Does it matter that the ECB's mandate is what it is? Does it matter the way the banking union, you know, fits in with the ECB's um, monetary policy mandate? I'm just trying to get at- I think, there, I, think there are, I think there are a few different things to say there. Okay. The first is that institution design is profoundly important. The rules on what boards of directors do in companies, and what powers and authorities they have, in what ways shareholders can and cannot select, challenge boards of directors are very important. And it's something similar is true with respect to public institutions. So the questions to which the federal Federalist Papers were addressed were profoundly important questions. And an important part of legislation is the design of institutions. Will a regulatory authority be an independent agency or will it report to the president? Will it have one chairman, one person in charge of it like the EPA or will it have a council of five people like the SEC? These are all immensely important questions and there's a body of learning um, about how to think about those kinds of questions. And it's more of a legal body of learning than an economic body of learning. So I'm not that knowledgeable about it, but I think it's an immensely important um, question. There's a second broad set of questions, which is in a 
democratic society where you have independent institutions, how should one think about the remit of those institutions and which choices are delegated to independent institutions and which choices need to be politically accountable. And that's the subject of a very good book Paul Tucker has written called Unelected Power, focusing on central banks, but also considering a wide variety of institutions. My general view there is that institutions that are independent, um, independence needs to be reciprocal, that if the president doesn't get to tell the Fed what to do about monetary policy, the Fed should not be using its moral authority to tell the president what to do about climate change or criminal justice uh, policy. In general, I think that independent, that power should be more circumscribed to areas where there's an important dynamic consistency problem, mm -hmm. which is what led to the creation of the independent institutions. So I am pretty spectacularly unenthused. I was extremely unenthusiastic when the Minneapolis Fed chose to participate in the debate over some kind of education referendum in uh, Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. When uh, central banks seek to um, get involved in green issues, if there's anything that's going to cause banks to fail, their supervisory authorities should pay attention to them. But I don't think the fact that there's some conceivable nexus between um, an issue and a bank failing means that central banks should get centrally involved in environmental policy. I think the idea that, for example, a central bank that is doing corporate QE should favor green bonds rather than non-green bonds is an appalling one. Um, because I don't think that's, I don't think making those choices is the appropriate uh, remit of, uh, uh, of uh, central, central banks. Um, so so I, and then there's a- Yeah. Go ahead. Just, I just want to ask about this particular. So then, on again going back to the sort of thermostat setup, the central bank buys all of the bonds, no matter you know green, purple, yellow with polka dots. But then, say the fiscal authority or the regulators adjust to the extent that this has undesirable effects on environmental policy, on distribution, et cetera, et cetera. Is that is sort of the division of the institutional division of labor ensures that we're not all confused with feedback effects and various kind of dynamic. Yeah, I think something. I think yeah, I think I think something like that. I mean, there there are complicated cases to sort out. Mm -hmm. um, I think we kind of make a model in the United States. Um, we had moments like the first few years of the Obama administration where the Fed was proudly doing QE mm -hmm. and explaining that selling long-term debt and buying back short-term debt was going to stimulate the economy in a desirable way. And the Treasury was proudly announcing that it was taking advantage of low long-term interest rates to term out the debt and was issuing less short-term debt and more long-term debt. And between the two of them, there were some brokers making money. And the whole thing didn't seem to me to make any sense. It seemed to me the United States ought to have one debt management policy. And there ought to be some mechanism for arriving at the one uh, debt management uh, policy. So I think there are hard cases, as there mm -hmm. always are, you know, just like in private life, there aren't just competitors and mergers. There are people, there are firms that in some spheres compete and in other spheres cooperate. And part of what good lawyers do is 
structure agreements and policies that in an imperfect world of greedy people cause that to work out as well as it can be worked out. And I think that kind of thinking is important in uh, the public sector as well. And I mean, just what you just said, though, I mean, it really does get to, at least in my view, what lawyers tend to be very good at, which is, you know, figuring out where the institutional structure leads us to stumble all over one another and saying, all right, you know, fire exit to the right. Um, but it's not just uh, sort of the traffic tweaks, right? It's building design that I think matters. And in some ways it's a more challenging. Um, yeah, I think it's, I, I think that's, I think that's right. I, I, I sort of believe in social science. Tell me and I, I tend to, I tend to find, and maybe this is unfair and reflects the limits of uh, my knowledge. Whereas I, I find your pronouncements on debt to be uh, substantially informed by empirical study of a substantial range of debt restructurings and what happened and what didn't happen and when it worked better and when it worked worse. I find a substantial part of legal scholarship on these matters to consists somewhat more of identifying what various thinkers have said at various points and the author offering an opinion as to what the author thinks is best with less grounding in uh, the world of experience. So um, where, um, hashtag bless you and thank you. And um, the uh, I do think that we need to uh, fix up your pipeline of legal scholarship somewhat, even though I'm I find myself to be a an unwitting beneficiary of the distortions in that. I'm pipeline. sure that's I'm sure that's right, and I I welcome all of, I, I welcome all of that, but I think it's um, you know I was. Uh, I was involved in the creation of the CFPB and uh, the Consumer Financial Products Bureau. Yep. And there were a set of questions. Should it be a committee? Should it have one head? Should it be, should it report to the president? Should it be independent? How should its budget be set? There were a set of institutional design questions. Mm -hmm. And I would say I was concerned to get empirical knowledge from the carefully considered experience of the hundred or so government agencies that exist. And as of that time, I was not hugely impressed by the body of empirical evidence on the question as distinct from consideration of the wise. But that was 13 years ago, and I may have been poorly advised at uh, that time. We just need to, we need to curate the, that pipeline. And um, I would like to take the, this moment to tell all the people who are DMing, texting, and emailing me, God love you, to put questions in the Q&A, um, where you will get uh, preference um, and uh, again, with massive thanks to all my friends, Larry, you're uh, being um, insightful and provocative as expected, <laughs> but I'm also being a disproportionate beneficiary of that. So Caleb um, Nygaard is uh, asking a very interesting question here about the recent scandals at the Fed. Um, and uh, this question of uh, structural governance reform um, that is percolating perhaps more actively than uh, than it uh, has been. Um, are there any structural changes that you might recommend? And then we have um, a few more questions here, but let's start with Fed 
uh, structure and, uh, and reform. I would um, probably allow the uh, Board of Governors to appoint the presidents of the regional feds. And I would probably um, cause the current boards of directors of the regional feds to be um, advisory boards. Because I think the, I, I think it's just hard to, it's just really hard to understand why um, bankers should be involved in the governance of their regulators. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the extreme case, which has been fixed, was when the board chairman of Goldman Sachs, when the, was before the financial crisis, when the New York Fed had three categories of directors, banker directors, business directors, and public interest directors, and the chairman of the board of the Goldman Sachs Corporation was a public interest director. Mm -hmm. That was a kind of extreme absurdity. And that is no longer the case. But I still think there's a kind of private sector involved, business private sector involved in its own regulation that I think is inappropriate. So I would put more responsibility for the whole Federal Reserve System on the governors. And I would take the various governance structures surrounding the regional feds, and I would make them into uh, advisory board uh, type structures. I would not, um, I, I would not um, favor the proposals to make uh, presidents of regional feds subject to Senate confirmation, because I think if anything, the Fed is too atomized right now. After all, if we can make decisions about war and peace with one Secretary of Defense, why do we make why do we need to have a committee of thirteen voting on monetary uh, policy? Um, I think the reason we have a committee is because, given that the job is in, given that. Uh, the agency is independent and not subject to political oversight, you can't give it to just one person um, because suppose they go wrong. And so in a sense, the function of having a committee is to act as a check and balance on that. But that requires that there be a committee, but not that each member of the committee be overly uh, empowered. So. In general, I think the Fed, where there's a kind of moderately strong, quite strong presumption of deference to the chairman, is a more effectively functioning institution than the Bank of England, where the chairman is more like the chief justice of the Supreme Court, kind of first among equals, but sometimes they get outvoted. And that's just kind of the way it happens. And you sort of got a jury of people, each of whom gets one vote, who make their decision. So that would be the change I would make uh, in administration. So this is fascinating in, in a number of ways, including because it um, tells our historian friends uh, about, you know, it sort of um, the importance of um, their work on things like the Fed founding and the Fed structure and the historical path dependence and the political factors animating this beyond the functional uh, reasons that you've articulated. And I wanted to commend to the folks a uh, post in the Q&A by um, my dear friend and co-host uh, Rosa Lostra on kind of some of these factors in the European context, of course. But I want to turn to a set of questions on uh, fiscal policy in particular, and um, then ask a uh, kind of a culture uh, slash personnel governance question. 
but then I am not letting this go without turning to IMF and World Bank and the international uh, economy, which is an uh, area that obviously is uh, uh, of great concern to both of us. And so just planting that. Um, on fiscal policy, I guess there are two sets of questions. Um, one is uh, the what you're describing in terms of, again, Windows thermostat um, may well be the platonic ideal, but in a world where um, the thermostat is broken or the window locks are broken, right? And sort of where one channel is shut off, isn't that the unusual case where the other channel should somehow try to figure out how to compensate? And then I would add, so how should legal designs and mandates and institutions sort of accommodate that possibility, if at all? Or should we just force a crisis in order to force reform? In other words, shouldn't we, should we not try to compensate for the dysfunction in one channel um, through the if the IMF isn't working, should, the World Bank shouldn't be doing its job and vice versa, or by any means necessary. That's sort of one translation. But the other is, you know, why, um, and I'm reading, uh, so uh, this is based on Alex uh, Mechanic's question here. Um, and then Yair Listikin uh, asks, why should there be any role for fiscal policy macro stabilization given Fed offset? Why shouldn't fiscal policy also strive to get it right on micro grounds entirely without worry about macro considerations? Isn't this in line with the thermostat analogy? So look, let me say a few things. I um, First of all, Anna, just so everybody who's listening is clear, I made a judgment coming on here that I hope is appropriate that I would most usefully contribute to your dialogues if I said what I really thought based on what I based on what I know, recognizing that I this is not a literature in which I've been uh, fully immersed and with the view that a clearly stated opinion, even if wrong, is a more useful target for inquiry than a bunch of polite mush. Um, Absolutely. So I have tried to very much take that position. I actually think that Yair kind of got it right. Um, the basic premise of Clintonomics was exactly that. The basic premise of Clintonomics was that for a set of micro allocative reasons, even though the economy was somewhat sluggish at the beginning of 1993, the right thing to do in order to have lower capital costs, lower interest rates, and more investment was to reduce the budget deficit, even though ceteris paribus, that might be contractionary, um, but that the Fed would, the Fed and the markets would offset that. So for the most part, I would apply the logic, and I think in the vast majority of normal times, fiscal policy should not be used as a stabilization uh, policy instrument. I think there is a particular extreme case around uh, the zero lower bound, and possibly a particular extreme case around circumstances where interest rates being too low or too high would have various other kinds of distortionary effects, which might cause one to deviate from uh, that doctrine, but that that is not, um, but that that is uh, not uh, the uh, usual case and that the more usual case is that fiscal policy decisions should not be made on, uh, aggregate demand and macroeconomic stabilization grounds. I think there's a kind of common fallacy in this area, which is macroeconomic policy is not being carried on very well, or we don't like the way it's being carried on. Therefore, we should try to use these other instruments 
to serve macroeconomic objectives. You know, if you think the Fed is too contractionary, I don't think that's particularly a reason to forgive student loan debt in order to stimulate demand. Because I think if the Fed's too contractionary, that will also influence its response to the fact that you stimulated demand with uh, your student loans. So it's back to uh, the thermostat. And I think one has to be careful. And this is a kind of general point where you sort of have to use your judgment. If you're a smart, creative person, you're likely in any context to be able to think of some reason why the thermostat analogy is not perfect. But you also have to think about all the flaws that come in, in terms of less focus, diverted accountability, all of those uh, things, when you start licensing all arguments on all subjects. So it's like the idea that I think is a common feature of naive economics courses, particularly taught by progressives, which is you should only have a you should only have government intervention if there's a market failure. But if you have a market failure, anything goes. And anytime something, if if something that's bad for my health will make you sad, that's an externality and that's a market failure. And when you go down that road, you get a, um, you can easily get on a very slippery slope to an enormously interventionist approach about which I think one should be cautious, recognizing that there are a variety of failures that come uh, from public sector interventions as well as private sector uh, interventions. So, Larry, I want to say that I'm really grateful, and I think we all are recognizing that, um, you know, this is not only have you got into a sort of unknown uh, um, field, shall we say, but one that doesn't, that may or may not exist in quite the form that it will end up in. So really, I do appreciate, and I think we all are engaging in kind of the finding the elephant project in good faith and um inevitably. absolutely and i i think I, you know i think to be clear i think the institution design mm -hmm. aspects of all of this are the most institutional design and institutional conduct are i think to me the most interesting and profound of these questions. To take, for example, a question that it seems to me that a group of policy-oriented lawyers ought to be good at thinking about, where I have never seen good systematic thought. Uh, how should one think about transparency? To take a setting apart from the public sector, why don't Transparency is good. Firms have information. Why don't we require them to share their information every day or every week rather than just do a quarterly statement? And presumably it's because we think at a certain point too much information becomes noise. Um, well, you know, there's the same set of questions around the Fed. Maybe the Fed chair. He sees every piece of data. Market participants would be really interested in knowing what he thought about it. It would give them more predictability and more clarity if they knew. Maybe the Fed chair should have a press conference every Monday. What? That, that, I, I, or, but probably not. But what are the set of considerations and how should one think about those aspects of the conduct of policy? Um, to take another example, in the Fed context, I've always found it mysterious that when I was Treasury Secretary and you and others 
would gather and we would discuss a policy issue. We always regarded it as important that our discussions be private. And we regarded it as inappropriate if either a summary was provided of our discussions, apart from whatever decision I announced as secretary, um, if a full discussion of, if a summary of our deliberations were provided, or if several years later, a full transcript of our meeting was provided, we would have regarded that as appalling. I think the Supreme Court would regard it as appalling uh, if it was suggested that with a 10 year lag, all judicial conferences be recorded and made available to historians and scholars who wanted to better understand the basis of Supreme Court decision making. And yet it's somehow taken as axiomatic that it's appropriate for the minutes of the Fed to be given in partial form after three weeks and after five years for them to be made public. Maybe that's the right thing to do because there's something different about the Fed, but I don't know what it is and how those kinds of decisions should be designed and thought through seems like an enormously important question. Uh, well, Secretary Summers, it's quite fascinating that in the process of you know freelancing and us free associating to some extent, I think you've gotten a couple of PhD dissertation topics out there um, for which we are grateful. And also you've given some of the friends who've written in these areas um, uh, another reason to tweet out their research. But um, I wanna ask two completely unrelated questions um, in the um, 63 seconds we've got remaining because I'm getting kicked out of my hotel room, quite literally. Um, and we've imposed on your time. One is um, how do we deal with um, groupthink at central banks? Um, and is there a reform project there? And two is um, should we ditch or radically reform the Bretton Woods system after what you've described as a massively disappointing outcome of the annual meetings? And you can take either both or neither, depending on how much time you want to uh, spend. On the Bretton Woods institutions, I think it's more a matter of they need to make different policy decisions that are wiser and better, rather than that there needs to be a new set of articles of agreement or a new institution um, established. Um, and I think it, so. I think it's a matter of the judgments that uh, those in, uh, those institutions um, are uh, are making. I'm not sure that the problem in central banks is groupthink rather than wrongthink. Mm -hmm. um, I obviously have thought Just over the last Peter. over the last year that the U.S. central bank has not so much recently, but in the in the in the twelve months from uh, May uh, April or May of 2021 to April or May of 2022, I haven't been shy about saying that I thought our central bank lost its way. I don't think they lost their way because they were unaware of what I was saying or unaware of the arguments that I was making. I just think they were wrong. And so I don't know whether, and I think it, it's another good research question, how to think about um, groupthink versus, um, you know, excessive groupthink versus excessive wrongthink and are they the same thing? I am aware of the streams of research suggesting that more diverse groups of decision makers make wiser, make wiser decisions. I'm not hugely convinced by all of that uh, 
by all of that research. And I think there are a lot of different dimensions of uh, diversity that go into it. And I suspect that an important element is missing in all the experimental work, which is that if I'm a group, of, if I'm part of a decision-making group, two elements are really important. One is that there be a variety of perspectives and they all get feeded in. And the other is that people can be completely ca candid, relaxed, and willing to change their minds with each other. And there tends to be some tension between those two things. If you let me be advised by three people who I've known for 20 years, I'm probably there's probably going to be more risk of groupthink, but I'm probably going to be more comfortable putting forth an idea and then withdrawing it. And I suspect that some of the experiments are done in ways that capture the benefit, but don't really capture some of the potential cost of forcing choice. So you could say, for example, corporate board of directors will always be better if you insist on, you know, every oil company deliberation will be better if you insist on there being a staunch environmental advocate present. And that, that's a reasonable argument. Most of the time when it's considered, the fact that probably if you do that, given the nature of human nature, you will substantially increase the probability that something will be leaked from the meetings. Um, probably bears on um, how that will impact on the deliberations. So I, I, I'm open to the idea that there should be some set of policies to uh, resist uh, groupthink, but I'm, I don't regard that at all as being a uh, proven case.